All right, KISS Army, welcome to the KISS FAQ Podcast. Thank you for giving us your time today and letting us into your head. I hope we don't do any damage. This is a KISS-related podcast by the board for the board. We hope that you enjoy. We'd love you to support this show. Please like, follow, and subscribe to us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Your likes and subscription helps us to grow and attract interviews and content. So please retweet and share our posts. Your contributions are appreciated. Hey, it's Jillian from the Kiss FAQ podcast. Uh, we're doing a little sidecast today because I've got Metal Mike from the 80s glam metal cast. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks, Julian. It's great to, hear, to be here, man. I'm excited. All right. Yeah, I'm excited, too. You've just put out your first book, Ooh, your hair metal, hair metal Journey. Awesome. Yeah, congratulations on that. You know, before we talk about some of the book, and, you know, there's a lot of KISS tangents in there and a lot of related bands that, you know, obviously toured with KISS, which is, you know, always a nice thing. The Wasp, the Dock, and the Queens, right? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which are all part of kind of the glam metal movement in a certain way. But what the hell made you think of doing a book? You know, it's, I guess, somewhere in everybody, right? They think they can do it. You know, I mean, you've done a ton of great books, so you know how it is. So for me, you know, I never really thought it would could happen, you know. And then one day the idea just got in my head. I was like, man, I'd really like to tell, like, my story of growing up in the 80s and all the cool stuff that you know, I experienced, the concerts I went to. And then, you know, the light bulb really went off when I was like, hey, man, you know, you interviewed like a hundred different eighties rockers. Maybe you could take some of that information, uh, combine it with your own personal story and, and make a book. So that's kind of how it started as it gets going. You know, we, we make a lot of discoveries. We, we kind of discover, like for me, I kind of discover how I got into this. What well, what about me before hair metal got me so into hair metal. And then as we get going even further, we figure out like what ruined this thing, you know, who was, who's to blame for the fall of hair metal. So a lot of fun things and interesting things come about through the journey. So, it, it was, you know, like I said it was a lot of fun to do that first book. I hope to do some more, but yeah, that's how it all came about. So, '80s glam metal cast is your podcast. Mm -hmm. what, why don't you tell folks who may not know about your podcast how that got started and what's the sort of ground that you cover there? Because it ties in with the book as well, doesn't it? Of course. Oh yeah. So for the, the podcast, you know, all that really happened, man, is, you know, I, I was doing a, a Twitter account and my Twitter account was, ba was just based on eighties glam bottle. And it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And a lot of these guys from uh, back in the day that I was fans, of started following me. So what not very different from the book. I get this half-assed idea. I was like, Hey, I'll start a podcast. I don't know anything about podcasts. See, but I'll do a podcast. So, so started the podcast started asking people like Ron Keel, Zach Stevens from Sabotage, the guys from Tiger Tales, you know, I started asking these guys, would you come on? And they're all very gracious and they came on and, and that's kind of where it started. You know, we just started interviewing these guys and there was all these questions that were burning in my head from a, a kid that I never really got answered by any other magazines or, or honestly, it was just cool to talk to my heroes about. So then I, it was just the same kind of idea with the book. You know, you just get this whim and you're like, hey, let's do a podcast. So started doing a podcast, didn't know anything about it, learned as I went. And, you know, we inter I interviewed a lot of those guys, you know, Ron Keel and and, and recently had Don Dockin. So I've talked to all, you know, a lot of my 80s uh, heroes from back in the day. But we do a lot of musical discussion, too. We'll do the top 10, you know, hair metal ballads and top 10 of certain years. And that kind of stuff, Julian, as you know, it's interactive. So people, like I said, if, if I do one and I talk to somebody in Keel, you don't like Keel, you're not going to listen to the, the Keel podcast. But if I do one where I'm talking about, you know, 10 different bands, that, you know, bands you like are in there, you might want to tweet or, or message me with your list. So that interaction, people really dig. But, you know, I'm never going to turn away if, you know. Paul or Gene want to come on or, you know, whoever, you know, I'm never going to turn away some of my heroes if, if, if and I still want to keep that interview stuff going. Yeah. Paul Stanley's top 10 glam metal hits from the eighties. I mean, that would be, <laughs> that'd be super fun, you know, to get to have him talk about some of the bands maybe that he toured with or, or wanted to tour with and couldn't get. Now the, I started reading this and I stopped dead in my tracks at the beginning. You're going back to the winter of 1985, 86 in upstate New York and discovering the Kiss, the Motley's, the Rats, 
the Dawkins, who were all in heavy rotation on MTV at the time. And that is an absolute mirror to my own experience and my discovery of basically heavy metal, um, which was in December 1985 in upstate New York, but a little bit south of you in Binghamton. Oh, so. Okay. So that's where I was living at the time, and that's how I got into Kiss and a whole bunch of other bands, Motley, uh, Dokken, Wasp, Rat. It was all at the same time. But when I flipped that switch on MTV at that time, you just had all these great music videos. The rap videos were fantastic. Twisted Sister was putting out great videos at the time. Dokken's videos, In and Out of Love, you know, all that stuff was was really really good very visual and that's your entry point isn't it you know at yeah. the beginning of this book it's really the transition tell me your story of my story <laughs> well exactly you know and, and that was the whole thing you know when i first started getting ideas of this i'm like wow i'd like to tell my story and then like you said you, you stop on your tracks and go like, well, wait a minute you know i'm just some schmuck from upstate new york who, who does a podcast nobody cares about my story but as I got going, I'm like, well, wait a minute. You could probably relate to the story if, if you're, you're close in age to me. I'm 47. So a lot of people probably got into the same stuff at the same time. You know, we went to record stores. We we bought the posters, the T-shirts. All that stuff was all part of this whole movement. So, yeah, I mean, it, like you said, it was those, you know, vibrant videos, outrageous people. I mean, it doesn't get any more crazier than, like, David Lee Roth in the in the Yankee Rose video. You know what I mean? It's, it's just over the top. And what I tried to do toward the beginning is I was like, well, you know, before hair model, I was still a young kid, but I mean, I was really into wrestling, pro wrestling, was into Batman and, and uh, Rambo and all this shit, you know? And it really isn't that far of a stretch. You know, if you go from all these characters, because who, these guys were all characters. Motley Crue were massive characters. So were Kiss, Alice Cooper, uh, John Rambo, uh, Kane Roberts, you know what I mean? So Blackie you know, Lawless, was, Chris Holmes. Blackie, oh my God. Yeah. I mean, it was just like all this, you know, fantasy and horror stuff was coming alive with these rockers. So yeah, man, that's exactly how it happened. You know, seeing tears are falling, Yankee Rose, Home Sweet Home. Those were those things where I'm just like, man, I love this. I want more of it. And then I think that's like you said, that's where the book kind of kicks off. And I just go crazy man i started going to concerts at a real young age buying all the merchandise and just loving it you know loving it yeah you got Dawkin playing on the back of a trailer going through hollywood you got david lee roth jumping off stages doing splits that yankee rose video is just something yeah. else that, that is timeless and stands up to this day you got paul stanley swinging like tarzan with a volcano in the background of a music video it yeah. really was a great time because it hadn't at that point become so cliched i know that the people who are in our age group, and I'm just a little bit older than you, uh, had older siblings who had kind of been the child of the 70s. So yep. we were like the next generation, the younger brothers and sisters in many ways of those of, of the 70s, because we may have crossed over to a certain extent of remembering Kiss in 78, 79, but a lot of us were too young to really appreciate it. And this is our music. These are my people. This is my crowd. You yeah. know, um, it, it really is a, a, a very explosive time to be a part of music and a very colorful one, especially in 85. I mean, Motley Crue had gone from leather and blood to, well, strands of neon like Kiss and Wasp had done <laughs> the same with Electric Circus. They were transitioning out of, you know, a more a, a toughened up look. They were all becoming very kind of homogenized. Same with rap, for that matter. You know, those those are kind of the big ones I remember. What was the music? What was the first song that you really remember grabbing your attention at that point and making you a fan of music, obviously, for life? Yeah, it's, it's really hard. It's hard to say because, like I said, I, I really could, even when I tried to think back, I really couldn't, you know, get it straight in my head what was first. But I, I think, like I said, those videos, I, those were like the first real big breakthroughs, I think. I think it was Yankee Rose, Home Sweet Home, Tears Are Falling. Like, those are the first three things that really stand out in my mind. And, of course, I bought those albums and then went back and just started getting, you know, past albums from these guys. So I think those are the ones that really stuck. Of course, did I hear Jump by Van Halen a, a couple of years before? Of course. You know, I mean, I, I was aware of some of that stuff, but I think it was those first ones. And that, those are the albums that I really focus on right as the book kicks off is Theater of Pain, Eat Him and Smile, and Asylum. I, those are like the first things that stand out in my mind. 
And that's why your book resonates, because it was Tears Are Falling. It was smoking in the boys' room for me. Yep. And on my birthday in December 1985, I went down to Kmart in Binghamton, <laughs> or v Vestal, actually, for that one, and bought those two albums. And then my first concert was David Lee Roth and Tesla for The Edom and Smile, January 87 in mm -hmm. Binghamton. That was my first uh, concert. So Tesla, to this day, re remains a lifelong love. That Mechanical Resonance album is just uh, beyond superlatives as one of the best albums from that era. And that's 86. Um, you know, th there is so much good music that comes out. But once you once you're hooked wh where your path takes you into the glam metal. I deviate from you because I went deeper into the Aerosmith and Pink Floyd and, uh, you know, some of the heavier stuff in punk. Uh, but you go into the glam metal. What was it that really resonated from that style of music that kept you going into the glam? You know, it's a good question. I really think it, it's a couple different things. I, I think I always enjoy that flamboyant image. You know what I mean? So I think that was it had to look a certain way. I always noticed that, like, if bands didn't look cool back when I was a kid, like, I, I didn't get into them. And that's as an adult, that feels very superficial to say. And it's kind of sad. But but I, I think that really was the deal. Like, the bands had to look cool. Uh, the sound always, I mean, I always like something with an edge. So I, even if we, I was a glam uh, hair metal guy, you know, I still like music that had some kind of an edge. But I think that's what it was. It was that look. And uh, that just that outrageous look that always caught my eye. And let's face it, you know, there's a lot of fandom. The book talks about all the fandom because it just keeps getting bigger, right? We talk about we start off in 85, 86. It just keeps getting crazier. I mean, I saw Motley Crue in 1987. That was my first concert in Utica. And that was with uh, Motley Crue and Whitesnake, two of the biggest hair metal bands alive. And here I am, 11 years old, you know? So it's just like, it just, it keeps building. I keep getting hooked. And then by the time I get to 18 or 1889, oh, I didn't go back in time. I went forward. 1989, um, it was just, I looked at that as that was like the zenith, the peak, you know, because not only did you have hard hitters like Kiss and Motley Crue doing albums that year, you also had all these new bands coming out like Pretty Boy Floyd and Nitro and Shotgun Messiah. So I feel like there was just so much to, to consume. And it really it goes back to, like I said, when I was a kid, I was a real completist. I had to have every action figure from a set, you know what I mean? And it was really that same behavior just happened with the hair model. Had to have every album, had to have them in chronological order in the cassette case, you know what I mean? So I just feel like for me, and I'm sure I'm not alone, we were completists, we were fanatics, and it just kept accelerating until it you know, crashed, as I'm sure we'll talk about in 1991. Yeah, so you seem to go forward, whereas I went backwards. So I discover Motley Crue with Theater of Pain, and I go back to Shout and Too Fast, and that's where I stick. That you know, when Girls came out, I was like, "Oh, this is okay," but I'd rather put on Shout at the Devil or or Too Fast. You know, with White Snake, that '87 album is a, an abomination. It's absolutely fantastic. Don't get me <laughs> wrong, but uh, I had already heard stuff from pre '84. At, so I knew that they were a blues rock band that were basically uh, putting on lipstick to sell records. And while it was really good, um, I was like, I'm going back to Saint and Sinner I'd rather, and Love Hunter. And so I went backwards. Great White, same, another great story. What a fantastic band they were in 87. But you go and listen to their earlier stuff. And I'm like, I like this more. So you go forward. Faster Pussycat, you like them? I do. Uh, but they're not one of my favorites. And, and if anybody who reads the book will notice, they're not focused on uh, very heavily. Uh, I do kind of mention them because they were on the Hot in the Shade tour. And, and I really like House of Pain. And, and I, I put in some. So, you know, the key thing that happens during the book is that, you know, after four years of doing the podcast, I mean, I really have. I'm not saying I've interviewed everybody, but I've interviewed a lot of people. So I have interviews with 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 Tammy Down from uh, Faster Pussy. I've got interviews with guys from Winger and Rat, and you know, you name it. As rare as rare, and as big as big. So all that stuff's injected. But I do like Faster Pussy Cat. They were more of a um, oh, like more of a Stonesy type of a thing. You know what I mean? Like that. At least especially that first album. They had more of a Stonesy New York Dolls type of a thing going on. So they were cool. I like that. And, and like you though, I. I did the same thing. Like I went back and I bought the early great white and I went back and I bought the early Motley Cruz. You know what I mean? So I loved, I loved all of it. And it was kind of cool because you could have great white being like metal, which I, I am with you. I prefer the metal sound of great white, but then they integrated that bluesy stuff with, um, 
They kept uh, it going. They they, they yeah. made that shift very nicely. I mean, it and was it much smoother than some bands like White Snake. Yeah. Now, see now with me with White Snake, I actually prefer uh, White Snake and Slip of the Tongue. Those are my favorite albums. I don't care about those earlier albums. I don't like that like that bluesy stuff. Some people do, some people don't. You know what I mean? But I think for me, my sweet spots eighty seven and Slip of the Tongue. There's no wrong answer. I mean, <laughs> come come on, come on. It's music. I'm I'm a guy here who always prattles on about Zodiac Mind Warp. So <laughs> there there are no wrong answers when it comes to music. Your tastes are your tastes, and yep. you don't have to justify them. So you know, as your journey progressed. Um, I, I'm doing the podcast. I mean, the great thing about doing podcasts is no experience is needed. And you've had the, you know, you've been lucky to talk to a lot of these guys who are making this music. Who stands out on a personal level from that massive amount of people that you have talked to? Who, who are some of the people that really opened your eyes and made you look at what they were doing back in the day in a whole new way? Wow, that, that's that's a good question. I mean, there's just so many things, you know, that it's, it's hard to put put my finger on it. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, the, the most important ones were the ones that I was like the biggest fans fan of. So, for example, I'll give you like Bruce Kulik. I was a big, like we said, I'm, I'm Kiss is my favorite band. And I got into Kiss right when Bruce Kulik got into Kiss. So I'm a huge Kiss nerd. I don't know if, if I, I can compete with you, uh, but I maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but anyways, but like to talk to Bruce Kulik and him to tell me these inside things that like even I didn't know. And I thought I knew everything, you know, when I talked to him about Alive 3. And I know I don't get into that in this book. I'm hoping to do a, another installment, but I always loved Alive 3. I thought Alive 3 could be my favorite alive and it's obviously his favorite alive it's the only one that he's on but he gets talking about how you know uh i was made for loving you was not part of the revenge tour they just did it at a sound shack and piped in uh, a crowd or something just stuff like that like like i didn't know that you know what i mean and, and now here's my hero telling me something that i don't know and just talking to me like a friend you know the other one was joe lynn turner i always thought joe lynn turner was amazing i mean between rainbow Obviously, I'm a big Ingve Malmsteen nut. And then with uh, Deep Purple, I've always been huge into Joe Lynn Turner. And then I'm interviewing him. And he's and every five seconds, he goes, Mike, let me tell you something, Mike. You know what I mean? And it's like, Joe Lynn Turner's called me by my name, even though, right, it doesn't take much to do that. But it's just that, like, I felt like I bonded with a lot of these guys. And then some of them I still talk to to this day. I don't, I'm not like a weirdo. Like, I would never like harass these people. Obviously, I've been able to keep this going for so long because I'm not, I don't like step over boundaries or anything like that. But every once in a while, you know, I'll shoot a text or a message when these guys say, how are you doing? You know, like I knew like Stevie James from Tiger Tales had a stroke, you know, and I just reached out to him one day and I said, I, I hope you're doing okay. I'm thinking about you, you know? So it's just nice that the friendship has continued with a lot of them. And, uh, but I just think, I think being big fans of things and then finding out something that I didn't know, but then also them treating me like a human being, you know, all that stuff kind of combined that, that, that all really felt good. There's still a massive market for these guys as well, especially now that we are at this age and they're at that age, because most of them aren't that much older than us. But no. we're all we are all getting on and we're all kind of appreciating our youths and the things that have helped shape our musical lives or in some ways other parts of our lives as well, because they are what's so important about the music is that they're part of the soundtrack to our lives yep. and it's also the soundtrack to their lives tiger tales that was a great fucking band yeah I mean, that was some really fun stuff uh yep. that that i loved that first album holy shit same yep. same with pretty boy floyd that first album as well you know i didn't stick with a lot of those bands again i kind of moved on but those were you know really great moments you get you also have poison in this book which is not one of my favorite bands. What, <laughs> what's your, what? And I don't know why. I mean, they're basically no different than Kiss. No. But you, like, but you like them, and why? Well, you know, I, it goes back to that impressionable stuff that came out, like I said, 1986. That's that's my year. That's my year I get into metal. Who's out, man? Poison and Cinderella. That's their debuts. Looking all glam doing their thing you know what i mean so it was just it really caught my attention and then some people you know you probably can relate to this there's just people that you like for whatever reason you know people always say well why do you like them i don't know why do i like pizza it tastes good you know i don't know you know like for me same thing with vince neal always liked vince neal i know vince neal 
has issues as a person, even as a singer. But I like Vince Neil. Always was my favorite guy. Brett Michaels, same way. Like, there's something about them. They're cool. You know, Brett Michaels, too, I, I mentioned this in the book. He doesn't sing that high. So even as a kid, it was like one of those, like, I can copy this guy. I can't copy Rob Halford, but I can copy Brett Michaels and, and, and just kind of sound like him, you know, when I'm singing in the shower. You know, it was just all those things. It was just, it just felt right. It was fun. And, you know, Poison is a band, not to bore you because you don't like them, but I really do think they evolved pretty well. When you get to, like, 1990, I think their musicianship got better. Their um, their songwriting got better. They toned down their look and, and, and actually became a little bit more serious musicians. So yeah, I, I like everything that Poison did. The only sad part about Poison, and as you, you talk, like a lot of bands, you kind of lose touch with them because they kind of died. You know, like when we get to 91, there may be a couple more straggler albums from these guys, but they're not promoted. They're not big. And then the bands kind of go away until this resurgence kind of happened in the early 2000s. So did grunge kill glam or was glam ready for a little break? Yeah. Okay. So at the end of this book, um, what we do is we kind of put up the suspects of, of who the murderers of, of glam metal are. And, you know, the least of the suspects are Nirvana and grunge. So no, grunge did not kill hair metal. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that killed hair metal. Like I said, buy the book and read what I think. No, I'll tell you a couple things. The obvious one that I'll give you, and you know this, everybody knows that knows this, so it's not a secret. The record labels killed hair metal. So what they did was they forced bands to use a cookie cutter kind of approach to do an album. They forced bands to put a power ballot on there. There's so, and this is what was happened, Julian, as the story is going, I'm like, it, I'm, I'm putting it together and I'm finding all these similar stories. Everybody's saying like, oh, the album was done. We were ready to put it out. It was heavier than usual. And, you know, Joe Schmo from the label says, uh-uh, got to go back to the drawing board and start over. I don't hear so, a hit. I don't hear a hit. We're, I don't hear the single. So this screwed a lot of people over in different ways. Um, J.D. Lane, I talk about that one in the book, but I, I obviously I never got to speak to him because he had passed away before I started the podcast. But, but everybody knows the story where he was like, the album was done. I think they were going to call it Uncle Tom's Cabin. And then all of a sudden they're like, I don't hear a single. Write me uh, Love in the Elevator Part 2, and he writes Cherry Pie. It works for that year, but it's everything that's wrong with the genre. And as the genre starts to die, that's the poster child for what's wrong with it. You know, when, when grunge hits and Nirvana and Alice in Chains, look at this cheesy shit with the giant smile and the freaking, you know, the, 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 the hose or the fire hose. I mean, it, 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 it plays into all the cliches. So, you know, yeah, the label's... You know, they got the hits. They got what they wanted. They're vampires. They got, they sucked the blood out. And then they left these guys to die. And, it, you know, you, you know, not to run on forever on the same topic, but, you know, you talked about, like, you know, going back and discovering early Motley Crue. Early Nirvana has the same kind of a thing going on. It's totally different than the thing that came before it. Parents don't like it. It's anti-establishment. And I think what happened at the end of the 80s is, like, Motley Crue, and Def Leppard and all these guys, they became part of the establishment, you know? And once mom and dad like your power ballad song, it's really not that cool anymore. You know what I mean? So I think these are the, some of the things, this kind of the concepts and the things that played out that killed hair model. It's the same story that's affected every kind of popular culture movement. The yeah. Beatles started in leather and were refined and made acceptable to the masses. Elvis was dangerous at the beginning, yep. but Colonel took him and packaged him and made him safe and presentable to the public and the masses. The only one that really runs counter to all that, uh, and you mentioned them right at the end there, is Nirvana. You mm -hmm. listen to Bleach and Love, uh, Love Buzz, and then you listen to in utero and they had gone against what the label wanted the label yeah. wanted another never mind um and they're like uh-uh we're gonna make something abrasive that clashes so they refuse to be um shaped and shifted and you know motley crew come on you see that happening with them look at girls 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 and put that next to shout at the devil you know mm -hmm. like, again it's the natural thing that happens to an artist as they gain a wider audience is that they have to be made safe the third la guns album is a great example of being watered down 
mm-hmm. uh, from what that first L.A. Guns album was. And that first L.A. Guns album to this day remains one of the albums I love the most, even though I know Paul Black has a whole shitload to do with it that Philip Lewis didn't. Um, <laughs> you know, so, I talk about that in the book. <laughs> I talked to Phil Lewis about that. It's in the book. Yeah, and I love Phil Lewis going back to his glam days in Girl. Uh, I'm still waiting for the girl reunion. I, you know, <laughs> last time I saw Phil, I was like, you know, I didn't get a chance to talk. I'm like, girl reunion, girl reunion, girl reunion, <laughs> you know, um, would be really nice to see. Def Leppard, I mean, they, they I, I don't think they, they sold out in any sense that they just had a really natural progression that worked in terms of what happened to them and having a drummer have those horrible things happen to him. And then, of course, what happened to Steve Clark, you know, so and Def Leppard remains my, one of my all-time favorite bands. I want to ping you on four bands and just ha- get your thoughts and stream of consciousness on these since they are all Kiss-related. Wasp, they open for a Kiss on two tours uh, and feature in your book. Uh, Talk Wasp for a minute. Wasp, I would probably say, was always like my third favorite band, you know, in the 80s. Because, you know, I don't know, once it goes back to like this character, you know, you got, you know, because I I actually did go back. I went back and I got the early albums. I got live at the Lyceum, you know what I mean? Well, he's doing all this crazy stuff. So he, you know, we talk about when we started about all these characters, you know, there's nothing more of a character than this guy. He's got saw blades on his arms, you know. He's, he's a little edgy. You know, he's a lot more, he's actually a lot edgy. He's way more edgier than a lot of these other bands that I was into. And uh, he's got an incredible voice. It's, there's nobody like him. It's such an awesome voice. He writes great songs. You know, that those are the things. But you know, one thing I want to say about Blackie, though, is it's, you know, unfortunately for Wasp, and this happens to Megadeth and a lot of these other guys, you know, Wasp thinks that, or Blackie thinks that Wasp is just him. And it's really not. You know, for me, after the headless shoulder, and it, it falls off big time. Chris Holmes is a big part of the sound. I thought Johnny Rod was a cool element. He's in the book. I talked to him about why. Johnny Rod is very cool. Yeah, right? So even, you know, people bust balls on Steve Riley because of all, you know, Steve Riley's L.A. Guns. I'm telling you, man, watch Live at, live at the Lyceum, listen to Live in the Raw. Steve Riley was a freaking animal. You know what I mean? Hey, no pun intended. He's an animal. Uh, but yeah, no, I love Wasp and I went heavy into the Wasp fandom, uh, the t-shirts and everything. Loved them. Did you catch them on the recent tour with Armored Saint? I did not. No, they didn't come near me at all. So no, I didn't catch them. No, I got to see them a couple of times on that. And it was great just to relive that music and that soundtrack again. And it was great to talk to Rick Fox in Nashville last year when I was there uh, Mm -hmm. about his, obviously his uh, central parts of the foundation of Wasp. Um, Another band, Dawkin, also open for Kiss in 85. You know, cool thing, like I said before, I had talked to Don Dockin. Now, the book is basically done at this point, right? Just like probably, I don't know, a month ago or something like that. It's done. And all of a sudden, I get all these emails because Don Dockin has a new album coming out. George Lynch has a new album coming out. Light bulb. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm going to interview these guys, and I'm going to help them promote their album. And then I'm going to ask questions that I'm going to insert into my book. So I'm no dummy. So, you know, I was able to, and I'm so glad that I was able to insert those guys into the story because, you know, they were a big part of, of me growing up. And, and, you know, I talk about my, my cousins gave me these three records to get started. They gave me out of the cellar, shout at the devil and tooth and nail. You know what I mean? So these are like, these are like right early into the, out of the gate. These are three of the best friggin' hair model albums ever, you know? So yeah, you know, they, they were, they were a big part of it for me. I love Don Dockett's voice and his songwriting. I love the way George Lynch plays. He's got that kind of little bit eeriness or evilness or edge to his playing. That's a lot different than somebody like Warren D. Martini, let's say. So no, man, I'm huge. And the big thing, Julian, that stands out to me is that 12 inch, uh, single for Dream Warriors. I think Dream Warriors will always be my favorite song by Dokken. The video just was next level stuff. And I think for me, like if, if I had to pick my favorite uh, song, it's going to be Dream Warriors. Love Dokken. Oh, I'm. It's not love. Oh, it's not love. Oh. Yeah, that's, that's great too. I, I love. I, it I think I, I think I may have said in and out of love earlier when I was talking about Dokken. But uh, again, all all this stuff kind of blends at this point. I love Dysfunctional as well. That's one of it the few eighty. That's one of the few eighties bands that really got back to be, uh, together in the nineties um, and made something outrageously good. I mean, if anyone has not checked out Dokken's Dysfunctional, um, 
it really is good but i'm also very partial to the european mix of breaking the chains the original version uh -huh, of that album yeah. um it, it's just one of those things that is worth tracking down don dawkin is the only one on the cover and it is credited to don dawkin as well at that point um queen's reich you've got operation mind crime i was out for my walk early before doing this and what did i have playing operation mind crime they opened for kiss in 1984 yeah, I mean, that was when I got into Queensryche, man, 1988. You know, I know they were kind of kicking around, but they, they weren't, you know, they didn't get the public's attention yet. So I got Operation Mindcrime based on the videos, and it blew my mind, man. And I was I was in that kind of rebellious phase, too. I kind of liked that conspiracy theory against the government kind of stuff. You know, when you're a teenager, that stuff's really appealing to you, you know? So I thought Operation Mindcrime was great. Uh, I love Jeff Tate's voice. You know, once again, it's back to that original band. You know what I mean? I like with um, I like when Chris DeGarmo was there and the whole sound and the songwriting that was coming out of that time. Now, Jeff Tate is an interesting one, and I've talked about this before. You know, I had him on the podcast, and I didn't know how to take him. You know, like sometimes when you're like you and I, I feel like we're having a pretty good conversation, and you probably related to this. Sometimes there's something going on, and and. You're talking to him and you're just like, does this guy not really want to be here? Does he think I'm a loser? <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. I was just getting a vibe, you know. But I think at some of these guys, you know, George Lynch, Jeff Tate, you know, their band members will tell you they're different, man. They're eccentric. They're they're different kinds of people. They can be difficult at times. But I think when I went back and I listened to the interview again, because I did for the book, I had to go back because I didn't transcribe everything. I just transcribed little bits and pieces and sent them to magazines. So, you know, there are parts that were fresh that were never put out there before. And when I did go back to the Jeff Tate, I was like, you know what? Jeff Tate's a little different and he can be difficult, but I think I'm probably getting the best version of him as a human being, you know? So, but no, I love Queensryche. I love Operation Mindcrime Empire. Um, Rage for Order. I even like the one Promised Land. Uh, yeah, love them. Yeah, Promised Land is a little dark. Rage for Order is great. I mean, that's yeah. when they're just finding their their feet. And Empire is my favorite Queen Stark album. Yeah. I did not like them back in the day because it was all EP and the warning at that point, and that just wasn't my what something I liked uh, uh, during my entry point. But you bring up something else that's really interesting with uh, mentioning Jeff there. Um, Vince Neil, Don Dawkin. They take a lot of shit online yeah. from the fans. And what I think people forget and ties in with your comments is that these musicians that are part of our lives are humans or human beings. Wait, that's a Queen's Art thing. Isn't it? Um, <laughs> it, no, it, it's they become, you know, mock worthy in some sense. And what we forget is that these people have given us so much joy. And now they're kind of like getting made fun of uh, as they're much older and struggling with the same shit that we most of us struggle with. <laughs> Knees hurt, back hurts. Um, but we don't have to get up on stage. And I know people say, well, they don't have to get up on stage. Well, that's their job. That's their life. That's their career. So. I think you're lucky that you've spoken with so many of these people that it really humanizes them for you. And has it changed your outlook when you now go and listen to something, you think about, you know, what they're singing about or talking about or how they're playing in a different way? Yeah, I think, you know, you make a good point there. Yeah, it does humanize them. And, you know, everybody likes to take a jab at Don Dawkins current vocal situation. You know what I mean? But then I had to, when it was time to do the interview, like I go back and I'm looking at it and, I, and I'm like, man, this guy's a legend. Like he, he made some great music. He's a big part of my growing up and me getting into music. So, so, okay. So today he's not who he was vocally, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Don't go see him. You know what I mean? So I try never to do, I mean, once in a while, I like to poke fun at everybody. We all do. You know what I mean? But you're right. We're all struggling, you know, with hair loss or weight or, you know, I, you all know, of I, the above, <laughs> right. You know, all the above. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's not cool. You know, one guy, I'll get, I'll tell you something. Vince Neil is a perfect example. I already told you he's my favorite guy in Motley Crue. Don't ask me why I never said anything bad about the guy ever online, but he blocks me on Twitter. Okay. I'm okay with it. Cause it's probably not him that runs the Twitter account. Anyways. I always try to go back to like, what do I like about Vince? I, it's that original thing that I got into. I think his voice sounds great on all those early albums. Does he struggle live as a singer? Of course. Has he gained a bunch of weight? Of course. But I'm never going to like 
Maybe I just did shit talk him. No, I, <laughs> no, I would never. I would always be in his corner, though. I'm. All, I'm gonna be a fan for life. I love Vince Neil. Exposed his solo album. I'm always in the Vince Neil corner. Even when they like guys like him, he blocks me. Ingve blocks me. I don't know why. Maybe I. Maybe I said something, or somebody who follows me commented and said something. But I'm never gonna take it personal. I'm always gonna go back to what I love about these guys. And the same thing with Ingve. I don't like what he does today. I don't. I don't like when he sings. I don't well, like. I, I don't. I don't need a singer or a drummer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't like that. I like, you know, marching out to. I don't even know. Maybe the one that he did with Tim Ripper Owens. Maybe not. But somewhere, I liked when he had singers and he had good songs and stuff like that. Maybe for me, man, that's just where it ends. Maybe Ingve doesn't exist. I don't have to buy those other albums, but I'm always going to enjoy those original ones and have a. You know, they have a great place in my heart, and I'm never going to take you know any of this online crap personal. Well, that was my playlist yesterday, was marching out through fire and ice. Um, I, I think I, I did throw in Facing the Animal um, yeah. for, for today and Seventh, uh, seventh Zero, whatever it is, the Michael Becerra album. Yeah. Um, but it may not be what you said. It may be something that, what, did Joe Lynn Turner say something? I mean, right. uh, yes. that could, you, you just never know that the dynamics that go on, the music business, I mean, Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley have said that the music, you know, it's like a four-way marriage or five-way in some of these bands. And most two-way marriages don't work out uh, these days. So you get a lot of personal dynamics, a lot of creative uh, issues that go, you know, between these guys and a lot of festering wounds. Um, you know, Yingve was going to be the last uh, person on my my little list of, you know, bands and musicians to talk to you about. I, I find him absolutely fascinating. Love his playing. The, the latest interview that he's done um, is really in-depth and gives me much more of a feel for him as a person because he's so open and talking about this stuff. But I haven't bought one of his albums in years now because I just don't like how they sound right. compared to how they sounded when it was more of a band. You listen to Trilogy, listen to Marching Out, uh, Eclipse, um, all of those albums are vibrant. All of those albums were also very much pinned on my brain from listening to them at the time. Um, so it makes it almost an impossible task for these musicians nowadays. Yeah. Motley Crue, I mean, Vince Neil, thank God he's still here. Thank God he can still sing, you know, that he gets up on stage. I've enjoyed every Motley show I've been to. So, mm -hmm. um, though I'm Team Mick, always <laughs> love you. No, and, and it has nothing to do with the current situation. I always loved watching Mick play and just what listening to the tone that he was ringing out of the neck of that guitar it has nothing to do with business. Um, that's none of mine. So, you know, they're, they're great bands. But we could talk all day about every single band that you've ever encountered, but that's not the purpose of this. And the purpose of this interview is very much that you've written a hair metal journey, which is a nice companion piece to your podcast because it lets people understand and also know more about you. Where can people find a hair metal journey? The hair metal journey is uh, pretty much exclusively on Amazon. It's an ebook, it's a paperback, and it's all pretty much done by them. It, you know, basically, you just order it, they'll print it on demand for you. It opens up, and you can get it uh, through the ebook through Kindle. So, yeah, it's just, it's just on Amazon. That's the only place you can get it. And I, you know, recommend, you know, if, if you like what you hear today and you're not familiar with the 80s glam model cast, follow me on Twitter. Uh, the YouTube, it's on Spotify, it's all over the place. So you Google it, you can't miss 80s glam metal cast. <laughs> so two last questions is, number one, what are your plans for the future with this now? Has it kind of lit a bug with you now that you've got one under your bonnet? Um, do you see yourself doing further explorations in print? Yeah, yeah, because, you know, I, I think I set it up just perfectly, right? It, the book ends in 1991. You know, I do envision another installment at some point. Um, but probably like what you've done with your books, you know, like once you do one, you kind of like, you're not ready to just jump right into another one. So I think right now, what I do right now is when I get little ideas, I just jot them down. But um, I don't think I would even entertain doing anything until like a year from now. You know what I mean? Like just maybe put it out a year from now. But I do think there needs to be a second installment. But the only thing that I noticed is that you, maybe you could relate to this kind of stuff too, is that like, I brought in all this cool stuff that I did, like I, I, the T-shirts and the record stores and the concert. All, you, know, I got, you know, I got it all out. So now I'm trying to figure out like, okay, I've got more stories from what the band happened to the bands in 92 and beyond. 
but what can we throw in that's personal? You know, that's just kind of stuff. Like I feel like I already threw that one out there. So I've got a year to kind of let this thing fester and figure out what the approach will be. I think it would be a darker book. I think this one is very lighthearted. It's coming from a child's point of view, right? I was face it. I was getting this shit when I was 10 years old. So if you look at it, well, well, I could just say I'm not a great author. So that's why it's childish. But, but it really, the memories are very childish. You know what I mean? Um, I think as a human being and what was going on with music and in the world, I think it would be a little bit more crazier and darker for 92 and beyond. So uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. I think it, it would have to be because of everything that happened in the 90s with the glam metal movement. I mean, in our age group, that was when we were finding our feet as adults and yep. really starting to adulting. Um, you know, so it is a little bit dark. You know, you know, childhood ends. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and there you go. Last question. Give us an album that we should listen to this week. Wow. You know what? I'm, how about this? I'm not going to give you an album, but I'm going to tell people to do what you had just said. Because I did that same, strangely enough, I did that same exact thing this week. I took, I went to Ingve Malmsteen on Spotify and I hit random, right? And I was getting all the, just as you were saying, okay, granted, I did skip some of the newer stuff, okay? <laughs> but like you said, Marching Out, Eclipse, Fire and Ice, Seven Sign, Odyssey, these albums kick major ass. He had something to prove. He was always challenging himself, doing different stuff. So, yeah, p listen to any one of those albums or do a shuffle because I, I'm on an Ingve roll right now, man. And I'm going to have to watch that interview that you just talked about because I want to hear what he has to say because I love Ingve. Nice. Metal Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Best of luck with the book and, you know, keep doing what you do on your podcast. Where can people I find the podcast? Oh, yeah, you can find the podcast on YouTube, and you can find it on Spotify. It's pretty much on any uh, podcast platform. Just search it up uh, on any platform, and you'll find it. Man, thanks for having me on. It was great talking with you. It sounds like we've got a lot of similar uh, interests with music, and I hope that we, we can talk some more. you got to come on my podcast now, so let's do it. All right, that sounds good. Thank you very much. Thanks, brother. Thank you for spending time listening to the KISS FAQ podcast today. All sales are final, there are no refunds. If you'd like, look us up on Facebook or come over to the KISS FAQ message board and discuss the topic we've broadcast today. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes, Spreaker, or wherever you've listened to the show. We hope you'll join us again.